entrepreneurs, are you trying to make bigger profits in your small business? If you're like most of us entrepreneurs, increasing your profitability is always on your mind. And you're probably looking for ways to grow your revenue while growing your company. Well, you've found a podcast that shares ideas to help you do just that. I'm Marcia Reiner. I'm a business growth strategist, and I've helped tons of small business owners to establish and implement a tangible plan that guarantees increased profitability and guides your growth and plans for a future exit. Because building a profitable and sale-ready business creates a win-win scenario. That's more money right now and a windfall when it's time to let go. And I look forward to sharing strategies I've learned with you on today's Profit with a Plan podcast. But before we get started, I have some exciting news. I've just launched a super powerful training called the 30 Day Profit Booster. This is where I show you how you can get an increase or a bump of 45% in net profit in just 30 days by following a simple three step method that doesn't require you to chase more customers. This is a quick and easy profit boosting strategy that can be done without spending more on marketing hiring additional staff, or working longer hours. Go check it out. It's available at www.30dayprofitbooster.com for more information. All right, listeners, I'm really excited to have my friend on with me today, Vanessa Judelman. And Vanessa is an author of Mastering Leadership, What It Takes to Lead in Today's Fast-Paced World. Vanessa is the president of Mosaic People Development, and for 20 years, she's been helping clients to develop leaders who inspire great results. She's a speaker, facilitator, talent management consultant, and certified coach. Vanessa has been a consultant and has worked in-house uh, as business leader, and by combining these experiences, she designs and delivers programs that are practical, customized, and can be applied to the job immediately. Welcome to Profit with a Plan podcast. Vanessa, I'm so excited to have you. Great to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. So we're in a time right now, I think, of flux in the business space where people are, you know, jumping ship and starting their own companies. There are people that are like, their, their side hustle is becoming a main gig. I mean, there's all sorts of changes going on. And with that, even more importantly, it's getting harder and harder to hire good talent. So I thought it was really good to have you come on today and talk to us a little bit about how we build leaders in the company, even from ourselves, right, to, to, to do this. So um, we had a brief introduction from you, but tell us how in the world did you come across becoming a leader development person? I know it's not exactly a typical career. You don't grow up thinking <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be a leadership consultant and coach. It's true. I did. I think I find everyone in my industry had a very roundabout route to get here. My roundabout route was actually through education. I was a teacher. I taught at-risk youth for a few years. And after I had a few binders thrown in my head, had I thought hmm, maybe this is not meant for me so I had a friend who's working at a training and consulting firm and she said I actually got promoted into an account management role and they're looking to hire somebody to replace me so I went in for an interview and I got the job and so I was pretty lucky because I started working in my say late 20s at a training and consulting firm and worked there for 10 years so wow. I got training on you know how to write proposals and how to invoice clients and how to um, create high performing, impactful programs. And so it really was honestly the best training ground. Right. Coming from a teacher, that's amazing because, you know, there's those people that say you have to have your formal education in a college, right? I do. And then I think I've learned so much more from the world of hard knocks than I ever got from, you know, college. I think it taught me how to learn and this taught me what I needed to know. Right. So interesting perspective from a, from a teacher. <laughs> hundred percent. In fact, my son, my older son is in the 11th grade right now and thinking about college and universities. Right. So I said that to him, you got to just remember that it's not the rest of your life. You, you know, it's, it's part of your education, but you're going to learn really uh, most of what you need to know in the workplace once you get into the workplace. So right. 
it's very relevant teach, your comments yeah, yeah it's hard it's it's hard to it's hard to teach kids that they have to continue their learning process i mean i've been a lifelong learner all my life whether it's you know business development personal development you know looking for a better mouse trap right you know i've always been trying and learning all of my life so um i think that's what what's really driven me uh to become well, a better business person yeah. Yeah. And I love that concept of lifelong learner, because I think for anyone who's an entrepreneur or a leader, you have to be a lifelong learner. I remember years ago, I worked in an organization and after I worked in consulting for many years, I thought I got to go in house now and like actually lead a team and, and be in the trenches. And that's where I actually learned the most being in the trenches as a leader, because leadership is really hard. You know, you can talk about it, you can consult about it, but being an actual leader is so hard. I mean, I had people who reported to me who were, who love my leadership style, people who did not appreciate my leadership style at all. And that's who I learned the most from because they really challenge you to, to dig a little deeper and develop yourself. Um, and the CEO in one of the organizations that I worked for, speaking of being a lifelong learner, he was a couple of months away from retirement and he still had a stack of books beside his bed. Cause we'd always, when we bumped into each other in the elevator, he'd always say to me, what are you reading? And I'd say, what are you reading? And we talk about books. He was that kind of leader. What I learned from him from a leadership perspective is he always found one thing that he could connect with everybody in the company. And this was a company with 500 employees, but if he found that thing that he could connect with you around. So for us, it was books it came up as a, co a topic of conversation and it was such a good lesson around how to really connect with people and build relationship with people as a leader. I think that's amazing. And wow, what a talent to, to know, you know, even a large portion of those 500 employees, you know, their yeah. name and, and what their interest was or, or, or so on. I mean, what a, that's, that's, that's a special skill. I think that, that not all of us have. So speaking of skills, let's talk a little bit about how we, you know, how we form as leaders and, and what are some of the skill sets we need to have to be better leaders? So that's a great question. And my answer is it depends. So a lot of people don't know that there's actually different levels of leadership. So hmm. when you're an individual contributor, whether you're an entrepreneur who runs your own business or you're um, somebody who works for an organization, um, before you have any employees or before you have a team, you're at what we call passage one of, of leadership, which is leading yourself. And that's when you move into management for the first time, you're actually moving into passage two, you're leading other people. When you move, then you move into passage three, where you're managing other managers, passage four is managing a function. And then passage five is managing an, an organization. So okay. at all of those passages of leadership, where you spend your time and the skills you need to develop are actually different. Uh, you know what? That makes total sense because you know that adage of what got you here is not going to get you there, right? You need to have different skills on that. So let's talk a little bit about, we, we kind of know how to lead ourselves, right? Because we've been doing it for a few years since birth, <laughs> but some of us are better than others by, by far. But as we start to transition into that passage number two, where we start to lead others, what are some of the skill sets that um, are are better than others or what that we should have strive to have? For sure. So, yeah, I mean, passage one, it's all about, uh, you know, your technical competence and your personal planning and your teamwork. But the minute you lead other people, that's the first time in your career where your time is split between mm -hmm. getting your job done. Right. And then managing other people, your time is split between yourself and others. Um, you also can't think, um, you know, when you're an individual contributor, you tend to think in terms of short-term horizon, but as soon as you become a leader and start leading other people, you have to start thinking more strategically. You have to start thinking about a longer-term horizon, planning a little bit more. Um, the other skills that are really, so that's one thing is to really start thinking about what it means to be strategic. The other thing is really around, the skills are really around coaching and developing your people. That becomes critical. Um, coaching is actually one of those skills, interestingly enough, that's relevant all the way at the leadership pipeline. Mm. So when I, when I coach CEOs, um, and executives, I'm still talking to them about coaching, you know, it's how do you have those conversations with people? How do you get people to solve their own problems? Um, so really that first level of leadership though, is very much about coaching planning. Um, and the other thing is team <clears throat> development. 
for the first time in your career, you now have to get results through other people. So what are you doing <laughs> to build a high performing team? I like that. I like that. You know, and that is kind of a challenge when you first get it. You're like, okay, do I have to be, you know, their friend or do I have to be the, you know, the, the, the ultimate person, you know, the off the tour, uh, whatever the word I'm trying to think of, you know, where you're, where you're in the control, you're in my space, you do it my way kind of thing. I mean, you have to get your styles laid out as well. But I think the biggest thing that got me was that you now have to deliver through somebody else. So you have to motivate them and guide them to perform in a way that gets the results that you need, right? Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned motivation because it can get a little bit complicated. Most, so what you need to know as a leader that's really important around motivation is that you actually can't motivate other people. Like we're adults, <laughs> adults need to be responsible for motivating themselves. What you can do though, is create an environment that is motivating for them. So how do you know what's motivating for another person, you might be saying, and what's motivating for you might not be motivating for somebody else. So you mean like the dangling carrot or the sharp pokey uh, fire stick behind you kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, like one person may be motivated by money. Somebody else may be motivated by work-life balance. Somebody else may be motivated by doing interesting work. In fact, the research indicates it's a top motivator for people at work if they're being paid fairly. Money's number five. The top one is doing interesting work, followed by number two is being in on things. Mm, being in the know, huh? Isn't that interesting? Wow. They want to be included in mm. understanding what's going on in the planning, in the organizing, in the next step they're going to take. I can completely see that part. You know, it's yeah. not just sitting in on the, on the story or the gossip, but it is, I want to be part of the direction I'm going in. So if I can be part of the plan and state that my goal is X or Y, then, Ooh, I can, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Love it. Yeah. So I, good. And so I would, I always say to leaders, this is where the co coaching comes into play is my favorite way to coach really well. This is a good, a good tip that I teach my leaders, the leaders that I work with is to ask what questions, questions that start with the word what, because they're very open-ended. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, especially those who are a little more life, a left brain, a little more analytical, think in terms of why. So mm -hmm. the challenge is to reposition those why questions into what questions. So if you're curious and to come from that place of curiosity rather than judgment, I think that's, that's a big learning for leaders when you start managing other people. Don't judge people because they're probably just wired differently than you. And it's okay mm -hmm. that they're motivated by different things. So a nice what question, for example, could be, um, what is motivating for you at work? Help me to understand. I want to make it, you know, this environment, the best environment for you. What do you find? I'm curious. What do you find motivating at work? How funny. The first thought that came to my mind was, what were you thinking when you did that? <laughs> so it was the opposite, right? It was the first pop what question that popped into my mind. Oh my gosh. As a parent, oh, right? You know. <laughs> oh, I let's rephrase her. that one. So do you mean if someone makes a mistake? Is that what you're thinking? Well, yeah, it was just, yeah, it just, that was the first what question that popped into my mind. That's why I was sitting here giggling by myself, you know, going, oh, I'm, you know, I need to change that one. <laughs> okay, let's work on that. Let's workshop that one. Yeah. So let's think of a, a more judgmental, because I think that's very common when somebody makes a mistake, you're like, what were you thinking, right? <laughs> so maybe if you come from that place of curiosity, it could sound like, okay, walk me through your process. What approach did you take that led you to that decision? Help me to understand that. Well done. You know, that that's a much better way of doing it. But you know, we're all human, right? And, yeah. and if something happened, and instead of why did you do it that way, you know, it, it, it just, it just, it just comes out a better way to lead them without judgment, or at least not wear it all over your face when you say it that way, you know, and, and, and master your, your ability. Because when we yeah. do it the right way, it's not necessarily just so we can appease their, the relationship and make it safe and friendly and welcoming, but you're building a leader that can start to think for themselves. For sure. And I mean, if you're developing somebody, part of your job as a leader, you know, when you move into passage two or passage three is to develop your team, right? You have to think about 
somebody's competence level. You And uh, I see a lot of leaders make mistakes around delegation because they just delegate and say, you go do this. And then somebody gives them something to do, uh, gives returns the work and it's not done very well. And they go, oh, I just should have done it myself, right? But if somebody's new to a task, you have to you have to really develop them, like invest in them, spend the time, be detail oriented. Um, and so like sometimes when people leaders say to me, "Well, I just don't delegate because they don't do it right." I say, "Okay, well, just pause a minute. Let's let's unpack this because how much experience do they have? How much time did you spend developing them? And maybe if you if you've spent a lot of time developing them and they still don't get it and it's not going well, they're probably just in the wrong job. Is there right. another place? Like what what are their skills? What are they good at?" I, See, let's put on our, our coaching hat and start asking some what questions. You know, what do you enjoy about working here? What what job do you see yourself doing um, a year from now? Um, what skills do you have that you think could serve the business better than what you're doing right now? So it's, again, it's that place of curiosity um, that really builds trust in your relationships. I like that. I'm gonna I'm gonna start using more what questions in in that kind of curiosity because that's fantastic. All right, so we learned about um, phase number one, um, we are managing ourselves and in phase number two, we're managing, learning to manage others. What comes on in phase number three? You mentioned delegating or developing, so, right? Uh, yeah, phase number three is a lot around selection. So now you're responsible for hiring. So you have to select the right people. You have to silo bust. If you're managing other managers, it's your responsibility to make sure you break down barriers across departments that you're also a really good role model. You have to role model what a good leader looks like. And you know, it's really interesting. I did a, a training session with a group of leaders this morning. I had 20 people in the room and somebody said to me, Vanessa, I've been doing a lot of reading around leadership because I, I was talking a lot about mindset and like, you know, really having a growth mindset. And she said, I've been reading a lot of books that, Anyone could be a good manager, but not everyone can be a good leader. And that breaks my heart because after developing leaders for over 20 years, that's not, not true. Some people really believe I can be a good manager. In other words, I can get into the details. I can facilitate process, but I can never be inspiring. Sure. And that makes me really sad that some people write that not everybody can be a good leader, but everyone can be a good manager and that other people internalize it and believe it. It's not and true. then never take that step um, to lead and inspire. I like that. Wow. Yeah. So, and then, so how does one do that then? You open the can of worms. How does someone step away from or, or bridge the gap between being a manager and inspiring as a leader? Yeah, that's a great question. So you have to do it really authentically. Whenever I work with a group of leaders, I talk about the three pillars of leadership success. You have to know yourself. You've got to manage your team and you have to lead your business. So in that mm. first pillar around know yourself, often I'll use a self-assessment like a disc profile or something like that, just to get an insight into what your work style is. What are your mm -hmm. strengths? What are your leaders? The disc profile, for example, has a section on what energizes you and what drains you as a manager. And I just think it's really nice for every leader to know that there's certain things about leadership that are going to drain you. And yeah. There's no good or bad, right or wrong around that. You're just human. And so when you understand what drains me, for me, I'm like, okay, well, what do I need to work on? Let's say, for example, you're someone who's a little higher on the introversion scale and what drains you is, is having crucial conversations. You ask yourself, can I avoid that as a leader? No, I can definitely not avoid that. I have to have those crucial conversations. So to me, that would be something you put on your development plan. But maybe there's something that you can, that drains you. So let's say you're someone who's much more of a big picture thinker and it drains you to like dig into your Excel spreadsheets and do more of the analytical work. No problem. Hire someone who has that skill set. Yeah. So compliment the holes. Compliment your holes. Exactly. Wow. I like that. Okay. And then, and then the inspiring part, right? Um, that to me sounds like if you, if you walk your walk or walk your talk, right? If, if you're doing what you say and you do it well and you're a caring, natural person, then others mm -hmm. will be attracted to follow you, right? I mean, that, uh, what is it, the attractive character kind of piece? Yeah, it's really about building trust. I think when people hear that I have to inspire my team, they think they have to be a super extroverted, you know, motivator, <laughs> cheerleader. 
you don't. If that's not mm. your work style, if that's not your personality, don't aspire to be something you're not. Be really authentic. How do you inspire your team? If you're an introvert or an extrovert, it doesn't matter what your what your personality is by building trust. You got to build mm. trust with them and be authentic. I mean, some of the the um, executives that I coach are very high on the introversion scale. And I had um, one leader, he's an actuary scientist, really smart. And he said to me, Vanessa, I always feel like I should be walking the floors more and talking to people and connecting with them, but it feels really inauthentic. So I said mm. to him, don't do that, don't do that. So don't do something that feels inauthentic. He said, but how is it, how the introvert people, person, leader, can I connect with my people? So we brainstormed some ideas. And what he ended up doing was creating these um, coffee meetings. So he would invite small groups of people and they would get together and they would have coffee. And that leveraged his work style, right? Wow. So yeah, really interesting. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, we all know that guy that was like, icky or that person that was icky because they weren't in their authentic um space right like like this guy trying to pace the floor and how you doing and people are feeling weird because he feels weird you know why are you looking over my shoulder kind of stuff when that wasn't his his natural comfort in it when others can do that and i think that i think that that's a really strong point that we need to still be ourselves right still be ourselves every day and, and manage in a way that is natural to us and or lead in a way. Question. Yeah, I, that's so true. Ask yourself this question. What is my goal? What is my goal? And see, there's another what question. And what can I do to accomplish that goal in a way that feels authentic to me? Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. Good. Okay. Wow. We've, uh, we're, we're, we're developing, we're, we're putting some skill sets in here that will help us be better leaders. I love this what question you keep pe peppering me with. It's perfect. Perfect for Marcia. She needs that. Um, so tell me then now, as we start to move into the next phase, phase four, and what that feels like, what kind of skills should we have for that? For sure. So, you know, when you're starting to manage a function, um, you have to think about a business but, but, you know, think like a business person. You have to have leadership maturity. You've got to really be able to collaborate with other functional leads across the business or across your business. Um, it's a lot about strategy, longer term horizon. And so those are some of the where you need to be spending your time. If you're in that passage, you have to get out of the weeds. Yeah. I always ask leaders in that, in that passage, what are you paid to do? Mm. What's on your to-do list that's not aligned with what you're paid to do and what do you need to delegate? And so the skills that you need are around strategic thinking, delegation, assimilating information, even organizational strategy becomes very critical at that phase of leadership. You know, that's really interesting because as we walk that, that, that pipeline, right? Um, mm -hmm. In the, in the early phase, we're doing everything. We've got all 12 hats on, we're juggling, we're trying to do it all. As with the next phase, we start to bring in people and give pieces off to them and leading them. Um, and then phase three, we're starting to really hire more people to do the roles we need. But in stage four, we're actually getting rid of the stuff that got us there, right? And we're looking at the bigger picture. And, and if you're working in a large corporation, your team may be a micro company inside of the larger organization. So you have to think of it as, as a whole. So I'm totally seeing the steps. I'm super visual. I'm totally seeing the steps and how they connect and how your, your, your skill set changes along the way, but you need step and, one before yes. you get to step four. Yes, it changes. And that means, yes, where you spend your time changes, what skills you need change. And so to get up the leadership pipeline, you have to let go of stuff. And I think that's <laughs> probably the, I know I can see you're having a visceral reaction to that, but right. that's the control hard. factor. <laughs> yeah, that's hard for people to let go of stuff mm -hmm. because sometimes it's things that you've built yourself over years right. and you feel a lot of connection or pride towards something that you built sometimes it's something you really enjoy doing, like, but, but mm -hmm. I enjoy doing this. And I'm like, well, 
that's nice. And it's not your job anymore. <laughs> right? You can and stay in that space if you like, but uh, if you want to, if you want to move up, then you have to move up in skill, right? Yes. Because, yes. And then leaders complain, Vanessa, I'm so overwhelmed. Right. Mm. And so this is the process, which is really important as you move up the, the leadership pipeline of prioritization, because if, mm. if you're really clear on what you're, what you're, what you're paid to do at this phase of leadership, you're really clear on that. Then you can look at your priorities and say, or look at your to-do list and say, actually, this is not a priority for me. I need to delegate this. This is not aligned with what I'm paid to do now. I need to let go of it. And I'm not saying letting go is easy, but I'm saying, if you want to focus on and get up that leadership pipeline and focus on what you need to at that level, you've got to let go. I love this. And it sounds like we're talking all about corporate, but we're not because in your smaller Cosmo of, of your business, you know, there are these same skill sets. They're just in a smaller, you know, level and you're not running multi-billion dollar, you know, budgets, you're running your own budget. And there's still these skill sets that apply to leaders in small companies that they do in the big companies, right? There's just not as many people that you're leading. So interesting, you know, I mean, that, that this, this goes across everywhere, every business. 100%, 100%. And you make an excellent point. When you're an entrepreneur, even if you have two employees, you're up the leadership pipeline, <laughs> right? And so yeah. what that means is you're you're the CEO and you're the manager of others. And so you're at the CEO of your own business. You're, you know, you're, you're setting the strategic direction. You're looking at trends of the external environment. You are um, building relationships in, out across the organization. Um, maybe you have a small board that you report to. So whether you're in a large organization, the CEO of a large organization or the CEO of a small business, you still have to be spending time on some of those more strategic areas. I love it. I love it. And this is important because it helps the business grow. It frees up your time as a business owner and it helps you. I love the way you're like, is this what I'm getting paid to do? Well, that's really still applies as a business owner. What is your most important piece that only you can do? And then delegating and leading the rest of the team to handle those pieces that you shouldn't be doing. Hmm, that is so true. And I think another skill that I work with executives on to develop or entrepreneurs, business owners, which might surprise you, is listening. Hmm. The more you get up the leadership pipeline, the more you just have to pause and listen. It's a great, and it's part of coaching. Coaching is a lot about listening, not making judgments looking for things like body language and tone, um, you know, verbal and nonverbal communication. I mean, those are skills you really need to develop. And the good emotional intelligence becomes really important, right? How do my emotions impact me and the people around me? Because as a leader, you set the tone. Hmm. In my leadership session this morning with a group of leaders, I said to them, I want all of you to think about what tone do you want to set on your team? So we went around the room and one person said, I want to select, so, um, have a collaborative tone. And someone else had a high trust tone and someone else said a focused tone. And what I loved about it is each one picked a different tone that was very authentic to them. Love but it. if you're running a business, you have to show up every work with that every, every day to work, thinking about the tone you want to set and consciously building it and developing it. Now we've all had those stressful days where there was traffic, a car accident, whatever it was, the, the, the spouse at home, the problem, the, the thing. And if you live in that stress, then your mm -hmm. team will live in that stress as well. Right? So if we can that's develop and choose. Yeah. That's your emotional intelligence is understanding how my stress impacts me and the people around me. Mm, this is good stuff. So there's a lot of juggling that involves becoming a leader, a good leader. I mean, you have to think forward, right? You have to uh, develop and, and build a team that's going to support that goal that you're thinking forward on. And then you've got to be, um, uh, you know, a therapist and a, a trainer and a leader and supporter and visionary. And all. there's a lot of things that involve becoming a leader. Do you have to run all of those all at the same time or can you segment them? 
It is a lot. You're absolutely <laughs> right. And that's why I always tell people, think about those three pillars of leadership success. Know yourself. If you want to start, start there. Start with mm-hmm. self-awareness. Do a self-assessment. Realize mm-hmm. and understand your strengths and weaknesses. Do a little work on your emotional intelligence and your mindset, right? Start there because then you're going to solidly move with a nice foundation and some confidence into that next pillar around managing your team, coaching them and giving them feedback and um, developing them. If you don't have the self-awareness, it's kind of hard to get into that second pillar. And then once you've got your team nicely, you know, high functioning and you're coaching them well, then you can focus on the lead your business piece, which is around executing strategically, leading and managing change, prioritizing and delegation. So I always, yeah, it's a, it is a lot. People, that's why I like to break it down into those pillars. Leadership's a lot. And you know what? A lot of people struggle because they've just never been taught how to lead. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. We, we came into business because we knew our jam, right? We knew our gig or, or our specialty and we came in and then like in the entrepreneurial space, mistakenly wrapped a business around it and have no skill set to handle all the balls that need to be in the air. But the same thing with the leader, you have to be developed into a leader. And I love the point that you said, work on yourself, because that's the only place you can control, right? You can't motivate others. You can't control others. But if you can control and motivate yourself, then that will emanate out to everybody else and you'll be able to bring them along easier that way. But it is something, it's a learned skill. You know, and you're absolutely right. It's a learned skill. And the good news is you can develop that skill. I always use the analogy of leadership to a sport, like pick your sport, tennis, golf, volleyball, baseball, whatever it is, pick your sport, right? Let's say you get on the tennis court for the first time. Well, you're going to hit the ball into the net a lot, right? Because it's your first time. It's the same as you step into a leadership role for the first time, you're going to make mistakes and that's okay. Mm. And instead of being hard on yourself and saying, oh, I'm terrible at this leadership thing. No, you go, okay, this is where mindset's really important. You have to, if you, if you know Carol Dweck's book where she talks about fixed and growth mindset, it's called Mindset, the New Psychology of Success. It's it the best that. leadership book. Because it talks, wow. she talks about, you know, if you make a mistake, for example, don't beat yourself up. Don't say I'm a terrible leader. Go to that growth mindset, which fixed mindset, you believe everything's set in stone. I'm a bad leader. Growth mindset, nothing's set in stone. If I choose to work on something, I can grow, I can develop. So as a leader, you have to have a growth mindset. You're going to make mistakes. Absolutely. And you have to say, okay, what will I learn from this? And what can I do differently next time? I love it. It's so important. You've really opened my eyes up to the the five pillars or, or or phases of being a leader and how one learns on the other and and these are just fantastic skill sets and you can also be a good manager and a good leader you just have to learn how and and develop and improve yourself and everything follows i love it it's been a really good learning learning concept for me right because you know you think in the small space oh I don't need to be a leader, but you do. You're leading mm-hmm. your company. You're leading your small team, your, your set of VAs, your one salesperson. You know, you're leading your family. You're leading mm-hmm. with your friends. I mean, this, this kind of skill set is, is valuable across, across your life. Oh, 100%. And I mean, even a little thing like feedback, knowing how to give positive feedback If you're leading a team of one person, think about this. For anyone listening who has a team of just one person, when was the last time you gave them positive feedback? When was the last time you said to them, you know what? You did such a good job managing that project and took so much initiative. And the impact on the business was that I was able to really focus on, I like how you say my jam. I like how you use that expression, right? My jam, (laughs) knowing that I could really rely on you to take care of your jam. Like, right positive feedback in your family too you're right we all need it we all need it uh, it's funny I, I i work with a client that um that felt awkward to him he was just like well i come from the military so you just do and one of his employees needed that kind of feedback and he and he opened up to it and gave it to him and his ploy that employee flourished for a little while right because that's what people need and um, what a good, what a good ending idea, having that feedback, because it really just, um, 
it, it makes you a better person. And it makes your team better at their job too. Yeah. Love it. Love it. All right, Vanessa, this has been a, just a value packed conversation. You've given us so many different ideas and ways to look at how we're leading uh, in, in the world. Where can listeners find out more about you? Oh, for sure. So you can definitely link in with me. I'd be delighted if you do that. You can go to my website, which is Mosaic People Development. And if you want some practical resources, I have a URL called Your Leadership resources.com and if you go there i've got a leadership quiz you can take um i've got some of my favorite blogs up there that you can read i blog every week you can sign up for my blog on your leadership resources.com as well this week i'm writing a blog about something i learned from a 13 year old boy oh get it, it. Was my son's basketball mate who did had this amazing it was like end of the game and there were 30 seconds left and he just um, he got fouled and he went up to the basket and he took two shots and he got them both in with so much confidence. And we won the game because of this kid. And afterwards I said to him, how do you just keep it all together? I was biting all my nails. I couldn't keep myself. <laughs> right. I was so stressed out. And you know what he said to me, he looked me in the eye and he said, confidence. Oh, Conf and that boy, I just learned a lesson from a 13 year old boy. Yeah, you did. You got schooled. I love it. Confidence. You know, That's can, what I'm blogging about this week. We can learn from anybody, you know? I mean, <laughs> leadership, employee, spouse, friend, child, there, there's always opportunities to, to learn. So great job. Great job. All right, listeners, I hope you found some ideas that you can put into your business right now that will help you be more profitable. And I know becoming a better leader a uh, leader for your customers, a leader for your team, a leader for yourself. And, and that will prove to be, uh, that will help the numbers along the way. So, hey, while you're at it, um, how would you like to increase your profitability by 45% in just the next 30 days? Don't think it's possible? Well, check out my new training called the 30-Day Profit Booster. This quick and easy profit boosting strategy can be done without spending more on marketing, hiring additional staff, or working longer hours. Get more information at 30dayprofitbooster.com. And Vanessa and I would love to hear your leadership story. Give us a tidbit, something that happened that you're proud that you overcame, or if you've got a question, hey, this happened, how do I respond to it? Hit us up in the chat and let us know what your, uh, what your question or feedback is, and Vanessa and I will respond. And while you're at it, please subscribe to today's podcast. You don't want to catch any, any, any future podcasts as we're always playing on Tuesdays and you can find us on any of your favorite players. So we're looking forward to more great profitable information on next week's show. So until then, make your plans and profitable. Thanks so much, Vanessa. Bye.